every year in the United States, there will be 130 million visits to emergency departments. The American College of Emergency Physicians lists 31,000 board certified emergency physicians to care for those patients. What that means is that in the lifetime of any provider, he or she will see thousands and thousands of patients in their career. In the years in my career, in the thousands of patients I've seen, for the most part, my medical training has served me well. I'm able to work up, treat, diagnose those patients in an appropriate fashion, and when I can't, I can make an appropriate follow-up plan. Every now and then, a patient comes along who changes all of that. They change how I practice medicine and how I think about the practice of my medicine as a whole. And on Saturday, March 27th of 2010, I met that patient. So this was a, a pretty quiet Saturday in the emergency department, 7 o'clock or so in the morning, and I had just come on to take sign out from the previous provider. We heard the code bells overhead, and it said code blue, ETA, 10 minutes. Now, every hospital has a pre-arrival system to let providers know when acutely ill patients are arriving, and the colors mean different things. In our hospital, a blue meant a critically ill patient with unstable vital signs. Low blood pressure, high heart rate, unstable breathing. But it doesn't give us any more information than that. So I walked over to our charge nurse who has her pulse on the whole of department, and I said, what's coming in? She looked worried. She said, it's a full-term pregnant patient. She was found having a seizure in her car. She's not responsive. And I knew that I better get ready. I walked back to the trauma room. Now, a, a typical trauma room is about the size of a big bedroom. And the trauma team and the emergency medicine team are the normal occupants of this room when those critical patients are coming in. In this particular case, we not only had trauma and emergency medicine, we had anesthesia and obstetrics. So there's a lot of doctors in one room. Add all the junior residents to that, those teams, the ancillary staff, x-ray te technicians and nurses, and it was pretty much a packed house. And when the patient came around the corner and I saw her pregnant belly rising above the stretcher, this is a sight that I'll never forget. The paramedics had been working hard and they were sweating. When they came through the door, this is what they said. Doctor, I got a 35-year-old pregnant female, full term, this is what we think, found having tonic clonic activity in her car, blood pressure's 200 over 100, heart rate's 130, respirations are seven, oxygen saturation, 76%. Go. Here's what I heard. I have an acutely ill pregnant patient who appears to be full term. And what that means is I have two acutely ill patients. And so we got to work. Anesthesia is at the head of the bedside. They're managing her airway. Trauma is cutting off her clothes and exposing the patient, looking for signs of what had happened today. Obstetrics is examining the belly and doing a vaginal exam. A beautifully run trauma is a beautiful thing. For my part, my emergency medicine colleagues and I were on the side of the patient. I had an ultrasound probe, which is common in the trauma room, and I took a look at the patient's heart. And this is what I saw. Now, the paramedic was correct. This heart rate is very fast, about 130 beats per minute, but it's beating, and that's important. And we're, what we're looking at here is a slice through the left side of the heart, right here. Left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium is here, there's the mitral valve. Okay, so I got a beating heart, too fast, but it's beating, that's important. I moved the probe down to the abdomen, I took a look at the baby's heart. Now, normal heart rate for an adult is 60 to 100. Normal heart rate for a fetus is 120 to 160. What I saw here, 62 beats per minute, was an ominous sign. Now, the combination of hypertension in pregnancy and seizures is something called eclampsia. And preeclampsia and eclampsia are conditions which exist on a spectrum of hypertension and protein that's found in the urine in pregnancy. Now, there are drugs that exist to treat that blood pressure, but if that condition pr progresses to neurologic signs, coma, seizures, and death, the only imminent treatment is delivering that baby. So when the nurses asked us, should we pull out drugs to lower this blood pressure, we said absolutely, and they pulled those drugs and they brought them over to the IV bags and they were just about to push them when one of the nurses who had been fumbling with the blood pressure cuff said, wait a minute, and she re-recorded the blood pressure, which had been 200 over 100 when she came in, and the number on the board said 80 over 50. And she said, stop, and we all stopped. And I said, is that right? And she rechecked it again, and it was. I moved the probe down to the side of the patient's belly, right to the right of her abdomen, and this is what I saw. 
Now what you're looking at here is the spleen and the diaphragm. This is the patient's head, this is her feet, that's her belly, and that's her back. And what you're seeing here is blood. The combination of free fluid blood found in the belly and hypotension is an ominous sign and can lead to death quickly. And trauma and obstetrics and all of us understood this. They said, don't give her that drug. Keep that blood pressure where it is. And we disconnected everything. Hung the fluid, put her on portable oxygen, packed her up as quickly as we can and pushed her right out in the hallway to get to the operating room. And as I walked down the hallway and I got to the elevator doors, we pushed her in and the elevator doors were closing. And that's where my role ends. And as those elevator doors were closing, I was looking at that patient and I was thinking, what just happened? So I'm gonna talk to you about what happened, but what I wanna talk to you about before then is how we got to the conclusion that we reached prior to planning her treatment. And that's ultrasound. So ultrasound is something that's not particularly new. This isn't dazzling technology. In fact, it's been around since the 50s. And we know what it is. These are mechanical longitudinal waves that propagate through a system and create pictures. Human hearing exists in a range from 20 to 20,000 hertz, and ultrasound is right above that frequency. Now, we do this in the emergency department a little bit differently than it's been done in the past. Rather than sending our patients away to radiology to get a clinical study that's you know, comprehensive in the whole belly or chest, we ask focused clinical questions. If I have a patient that comes in with abdominal pain, it's been going on for a couple days, it's worse after eating, I say, maybe this patient has gallstones. And as I'm doing my physical exam and taking my history, I pull up the ultrasound probe and I just take a look. And in fact, the machine comes with me into almost every patient that I see. I can do this at the bedside. It's fast, it's cheap, it's safe, it's non-invasive. There's not much in medicine that we can say those things about. So the, we image the three-dimensional structures of the body in two-dimensional planes and we create pictures, and we use those pictures to help interpret and diagnose and teach. Now, let's talk about the heart for a second, because this is one of the first things that we start off with when we teach medical students how to do a physical exam. We ask them to put their stethoscope on the heart of a healthy patient, and when they do, they hear something like this. What you're hearing are the heart sounds that are created by the first pair of valves and then the second pair of valves closing, and the associated turbulent blood smacks up right against those valves. Okay, and that's a sound that a lot of us are familiar with. And once our medical students know what normal is, we want them to know what abnormal is. And so diseases of the valves create extra heart sounds, much like water rushing in a bubbling br brook. Mitral regurgitation, for example, is a disease where the mitral valve, which separates the left atrium and the left ventricle, gets faulty. And this leaky valve allows blood to flow back into the left atrium. So it creates this whooshing sound in the middle of the cardiac cycle like this. Okay, so that's different, right? Let's talk about the same valve, but a different disease, mitral stenosis. Okay, this is where the valve gets very, very narrow as a result of medical disease or scarring. Also creates a mid, uh, cardiac cycle whoosh, but a little earlier, and it sounds like this. So I think everybody would agree that those sounds are different, but figuring out exactly where they live in the cardiac cycle is very difficult, and it's hard for students to understand this. It's hard for us to teach it. But when we can show it to them, that changes everything. What you're looking at here is a picture of the heart. You've got all four chambers, left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, and right ventricle. And what you're seeing here in the two separate colors is not arterial and venous blood, but bidirectional flow. The ultrasound probe is able to detect whether objects are flowing towards it or away from it via the Doppler effect. It assigns colors to those two different directions and allows us to see the difference. So in this particular case, rather than having blood flow appropriately from the left atrium to the left ventricle, we're seeing it flow back due to that leaky valve. When we add the sound associated with that picture, it becomes much easier to understand and teach. Now we're going to look at a normal heart today, and one of your colleagues actually has very generously offered to give his heart, quite literally, for the university. <laughs> and so he's going to uh, come up here and uh, show us uh, what's going on today. Now when we look... <laughs> when we <laughs> this is just preparation for medical school here. 
Now, when we look at the human heart, I just spun it around and so you can see the back of the heart here. And this is the left side, okay? This is what we're gonna cut right in half. Think about that, three-dimensional structure in a two-dimensional plane. And when we do that, we see the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and the aorta, okay? The probe's gonna come down, create a two-dimensional plane, and show us this. And again, we've got left side of the heart and right side of the heart. And the aorta right there at the bottom of the screen. Lovely sound effect. <laughs> this is why I'm always thrilled to be mic'd. So what we're looking at here is James's normal heart. And what I want you to pay attention to are the fact that He's got a nice, normally contracting heart. He's got the lining of the heart, which abuts the heart muscle. There's no fluid around the heart. The valve is working appropriately. And this heart looks great. Now, contrast that to the heart that you see here. The fluid that you're seeing in this little space right here is a pericardial effusion. James has a nice, normal lining here. And what I'm looking at here is a pericardial effusion in the lining of the heart of a patient who went to the catheter, catheterization lab to, ha to have treatment for a heart attack but had a complication and that catheter wire nicked the pericardium and he bled. And when that fluid accumulates enough pressure that it equalizes between the sac and the heart, the heart can no longer collapse and cardiovascular collapse ensues. Now take a look at the contractility of James's heart. You see that nice contractile muscle there? Looking at this particular heart here, those valves are opening and closing, but the heart muscle is very sluggish. And so we're looking at it here, and this particular heart is just not pumping. Now this is gonna drop the blood pressure, but a patient who comes in with congestive heart failure, which is what this patient has, and another infection like pneumonia can have low blood pressure for lots of reasons. A patient with pneumonia who's septic needs fluids. A patient with congestive heart failure needs a diuretic to remove fluid. Totally opposite treatment. And sometimes we don't know which is which until we can see what this heart is doing here. Now let's take a look at the abdomen for a second. So if we peel back the layers of the abdomen and look inside, what we've got here are the spleen and the kidney that we see here. If we were to look at an ultrasound picture of this, we're going to see something that looks like that. Again, spleen and kidney. Now, blood is going to roll downhill like most things. And if I'm going to see free fluid in the belly, I'm going to see it right here between the diaphragm, the spleen, and the kidney, and it's going to create a black stripe right through here. If we take a look at James's spleen, what we see here is a nice picture. A normal, homogeneous spleen with a kidney abutted right up next to it and the respirophasic diaphragm. This is his diaphragm moving up and down as he breathes. The organs are snugged right up tight next to each other where they want to be. But if we take a look at this picture, here we see free fluid sitting between the spleen and the kidney. And that spleen is kind of floating in all of that blood. This is the picture of a patient who came in with a gunshot wound to the abdomen and also needed emergent surgery. Now, what else can we see with this? So looking above here, if I move my probe right here, what I can see is the bright white line of James's diaphragm right here. When I look above that diaphragm, all I see is kind of artifact, which is appropriate. Looking at the patient here, what I'm seeing above the diaphragm is black fluid. This is a pleural effusion in the case of a patient with malignant melanoma. That cancer had metastasized to the lining of the lungs and had caused a buildup of fluid above the lungs. Now, x-ray is bad for this. X-ray can't really tell me the difference between an effusion related to fluid and a pneumonia. CAT scan can, but then I have to send the patient out of the department, and if they're very sick, that's a very bad idea. This is something that can help me right at the bedside. Thank you, James. Give James a hand.
But let's get back to that day in March. When we saw this free fluid in the abdomen, we knew we had to act fast. And when those elevator doors closed right in front of me, that elevator dropped to the basement of the hospital. It opened up into the hallway, and they opened up one of the operating rooms. Trauma and obstetrics crash scrubbed and went in to, to see the patient. They did a classical incision from her sternum to her pubis. Obstetrics opened up the uterus. They extracted a full-term little boy who was badly struggling. This little baby was transferred to Children's Hospital for advanced respiratory care. His parents named him Devin. And he died on day number three. Two years and eight months later, however, what we know, now know is that the patient was suffering from something called a splenic artery aneurysm. What you see here is an outpouching of the aorta caused by a bulge in the weakened muscle of the artery. The splenic artery comes off right up top up here, and what we realize is that in the ninth month of her pregnancy, this artery burst. The patient required six liters of blood, seven liters of crystalloid, fresh frozen plasma, platelets, everything that we can think of to treat critically ill patients. And she lived. And her uterus lived. And two years ago, two years and eight months ago, she had this little boy. Now, I claim that ultrasound is making me a better doctor, but Carl Sagan said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And we have some pretty extraordinary evidence with us here today because this little boy's mother is here with us. Come up. I don't often get to publicly thank the patients that I treat, so this is a very special opportunity because what's actually making me and every other provider a better doctor are the patients that we treat and the teaching that they give us. So thank you. Thank you.